All right, so thank you all. Uh, my name is Aditya, and this talk is titled Koro, Translating Code to Other Human Languages and Back Again. Uh, I've been writing JavaScript off and on for, like, well, my first brush in with JavaScript was nearly 20 years ago at this point. Um, but these days, my primary language is, isn't JavaScript. It's actually Go. So I've been writing Go, Go full time for the last seven years. And today, I'm going to be taking a look at some work that's been done in Go and seeing how we might apply that same work to the JavaScript world as well. So even though my examples are going to be uh, mostly in Go, everything you see today can and should be done in JavaScript too. How many of you speak English as a second language? OK, that's the overwhelming majority here. So worldwide, only 5% of the world speaks English as their first language. And only about 11% uh, speaks English at all. So that means that the majority of people who speak English speak it as their second language. And if this conference were perfectly representative of the entire world in every way, that means that only 165 people out of this entire conference would be able to understand this talk. And of those, all but 75 would be listening to me speak in what's for them a foreign language. As we like to say, software is eating the world, but also JavaScript is eating software. I don't just mean that things are moving to the web, which is, has always been JavaScript's platform of dominance, but JavaScript's also being used in ways that, we're, that we never really uh, uh, thought of uh, maybe like 20 years ago. Node.js was launched on this very stage 10 years ago at this conference, and that completely changed the way in which we think, uh, in which we think of JavaScript. JavaScript is now being used. Uh, you can use JavaScript to write Excel macros. Try explaining that to someone in the mid-90s that, you know, yes, someday that you're going to be using LiveScript to write your Microsoft Office macros. You also, if you want to do permissioning uh, logic within, uh, within Linux, you're going to be writing JavaScript rules because you're going to be using Polkit for that, and Polkit executes JavaScript rules. So technology, which includes software, is a powerful enabling force. And we have the, we have the ability to, to do amazing things on a global scale using software. Thanks to software, we're able to take pictures of a black hole that's 55 million light years away. We can treat and cure diseases that would have been thought chronic or even fatal just a few decades ago. We might not think of this as achievements of software specifically, but software is actually the underlying force that's powering and enabling all of these. But software can also be used for some pretty terrible things as well. People have written software that's used to enable oppression or to inflict violence or even commit genocide. If we think that software is a powerful and enabling force, then we need to take a careful look at who it empowers and who it enables and what that allows them to do. I have relatives who don't speak English. If one of them came to me and said that they want to learn to write software then, and, and asked me for advice on what to do, the first thing I'd say is, well, you have to learn English. Because if you don't speak English, you're not really going to be able to do much in, uh, in the software world, certainly not in open source uh, software development. If, uh, you know, especially if you don't even, speak, if, if you don't even uh, read the Latin script because your native language uses a different script altogether. That itself is a barrier. So if writing software is only an option for uh, the 10% of the world who can speak English, that has huge implications about what it means when we say that software is a power, an empowering and enabling force. So if JavaScript wants to be the future of software development, and we think that software development is going to be, uh, is going to be an enabling force for the world, then we need to make sure that writing JavaScript is accessible to people of all languages, not just English. The idea of eliminating natural language barriers to programming isn't new at all. In fact, it's very old. Grace Hopper is one of the first uh, computer scientists, and she wrote the very first compiler for a high-level programming language. Right behind me, there's the, there's the hall of computer scientists, the pioneers. I, uh, you should go check out her portrait there. The language that Grace Hopper invented was called COBOL, and she wanted, uh, the goal with that was to have English-like natural language syntax so that business executives could write code. She got a lot of pushback about this because engineers thought, well, you know, if, uh, if non-engineers can write code, this can put us out of a job. But Hopper actually took this vision even further. Why restrict this to English-like syntax? You know, if, uh, what if engineers who speak other languages want to be able to write code as well? And she wanted COBOL to be, and I quote, a language you can use to talk to people around the world.
And the response she got to that was even more vitriolic. Was, they basically said, you know, how can we teach American computers to, ru to run German programs? And that, that, that wasn't an accident. The, you know, this wasn't a, a question of how it could be done technically. It was very much a political question. This was the 1950s, and so in the US military, which is where Hopper is working, the fear of a threat from Germany or Russia was still a huge, uh, a huge uh, a fear in people's minds. But even if uh, Hopper, Hopper's idea was put on the back burner in the 1950s due to, pol to xenophobia and, and uh, Cold War politics, we can look at what that means today and apply, and, and apply that approach to, to modern languages. So this is Hopper speaking about COBOL many years later. She said, you know, I would have thought that it would be useful to NATO because they had the common verbs for the things that they were going to do. And the nouns, they'd just have to have a dictionary for the things they were referring to for inventory control. They'd have common nouns throughout NATO, and they could make a dictionary of common verbs and translate the program. You could write one in English, and you could translate it, and it could go to the other language. No problem, you'd have communication. It would be a limited vocabulary. One thing that's interesting to note here is just that Hopper chose the imperative mood specifically because she thought it would be universal to languages. So not all languages distinguish between past, present, future tenses in the same way, but languages generally have a way of commanding people to do something. And COBOL was one of the languages which popularized the imperative programming styles, and that's what, uh, that stuck with us to this day. Even JavaScript, which is, has uh, the capabilities of a functional language, we still usually use uh, imper uh, imperatives for, the, for function names, and that's indirectly a result of this tradition that Grace Hopper started. So let's see what we get when we take the principles of Hopper's vision and apply that to a modern programming language like JavaScript or Go. So to answer that question, we can take a look at Koro. Koro is an extension of the Go compiler and toolchain to support Bengali. The name Koro is an idiomatic translation of the English name Go. In a moment, I'll, you'll see why I chose Go for this example, and that's for some technical reasons we'll get into. But as for Bengali, well, I chose that because Bengali is it's the language my family speaks. And you know, we're Bengali, and if you talk to Bengali people about our language and culture, um, you'll see very quickly that we're pretty proud of it. The Bengali, as we like to say, is the language that's so beautiful, people literally fought a revolution, an entire war, to defend the right to speak it. The United Nations more recently actually issued a declaration stating that Bengali was the, uh, was the sweetest sound sounding language in the entire world. But on a more practical note, Bengali is a pretty common language. After Hindi, it's the, it's the most common language spoken in India, and it's also the national language of Bangladesh. Combined, that means that it's the seventh most widely spoken language in the entire world. There are more native speakers of Bengali than there are of German and French combined. And Bengali also uses, as you can see here, a non-Latin script. So it gives us an opportunity to test the, the boundaries of what we can do with Unicode and how, uh, how characters get treated and how they are rendered in, in languages outside the ASCII code range. But again, nothing that I'm doing here is unique to Bengali or, or to Go. So if you speak another language, which it seems like the majority of this room does, I'd encourage you to go home and try to do this with your own language as well. So this right here is just a simple hello world written uh, in, in standard Go. Um, even if you don't, you know, if you've never written a line of Go, you can uh, pretty much guess what it's doing here. And this is that equivalent program that's written in Koro. Now, we've left the identifier names intact, but the, all the keywords have now been translated to Bengali. And yes, I did not forget true. True is actually, unlike JavaScript, true is not a keyword in Go. And so, Based on, based on seeing the previous slide, you can take a guess at what, uh, what this program is doing. If you don't speak Bengali, you might not be able to figure it out from scratch. But if you do, this is a whole lot more readable than what we just saw on the previous slide. But the first challenge we need to do here is we need to get this program to run, because the Go compiler isn't going to know what to do with, uh, with these keywords. They're not standard Go keywords. But here, we can take advantage of a nice trick. And this is why we chose Go for this example. Go's source code is all UTF-8. So the Go compiler has no trouble dealing with non-ASCII characters in Go, in Go programs. And the Go compiler is bootstrapped. It's written in Go. So that means that the Go compiler is just a Go program. So that means that the Go compiler has no trouble dealing with non-ASCII uh, keyword definitions or, or strings. And there are a few non-alphabetic, or there are a few checks that ensure that non-alphabetic or non-Latin characters aren't going to be used in keywords, but it 
turns out that you can just disable them and nothing actually goes wrong. So if we just disable them, all we need to do is uh, extend the mapping that has the strings, uh, that maps strings to, uh, to the internal tokens and extend those to include the Bengali translations of the keywords as well. JavaScript already has the analogous concept of uh, transformations, and that's something that's used very heavily in JavaScript, uh, you know, with languages like TypeScript or also with, um, with polyfills. And it, it's a little trickier to do this for reasons of, you know, that have to do with compiler architecture, which I'm not really going to get into, but it's still, it's, it, it's fairly similar. It's still very much possible to use this same approach in JavaScript to translate from one human language to another or one dialect of a, of a programming language to another. So having made those changes, here's what that Hello World program looks like in practice. So you can see the program, and we're going to run it. There we go. Thank you. <laughs> but remember, our goal is to defragment open source development, not to fragment it further. So we need to make sure that our code that we're writing in Coro is still interoperable with code that English-speaking Go developers are going to use as well. And we don't have to want to have to translate every program manually because that, you know, that would be infeasible. And of course, computers are here to do the heavy lifting for us. Well, conveniently for translation, Go already has a handy utility for formatting source code. It's called GoFormat, or depending on how you pronounce it, GoFumped. And mostly we use GoFormat to prevent bike shedding over arguments like tabs versus spaces or semicolons, things like that. But uh, so instead of arguing over, you know, uh, which is the proper way to indent your code, you just set up your editor whatever the way you want and then to, to render tabs however you want them to be. And then when you save your code, it just gets Go formatted and then it's committed in the standard form. So if I want to use four spaces for indentation and you want to use two, Go format means we can still work together. We don't need to fight about this. I'll just set up my editor to render it with the width I want and then we don't even need to know that we have different indentation preferences because the code that's committed is still in the standard form. But GoFormat handles a lot more than that as well, because it's syntax aware. So it can do things like remove unnecessary parentheses and ensure that it will never change your code semantics. That's a simpler way of saying that it's a great way of performing fully isomorphic translations of source code. And that's exactly what we want here. So all we have to do is extend GoFormat and, uh, and repurpose it for translating English Go, Go code into Bengali or vice versa. And that's what Coro Format does. So let's translate that same program written in Coro back into English-speaking Go and run it. So here's the Coral program. And now we can format it, and we get the English program again. But if you don't believe me, we can actually run it and prove that it does the exact same thing. There we go. We just translated from, from one language to another and back again. So there we go. So the same way that you didn't know that I was using four spaces for tabs and I didn't know that you were using two, go, having, having bi-directional translation layers means that you don't need to know that I'm writing my code in English. And I don't need to know that you're writing your code in German or in Spanish or, or in Marathi or whatever language that you happen to speak. We can still work together and we localize our source code as a commit hook and then our editor will just display it for us in the language that we want. As a developer, Coro means that we only need to look at source code in our own language. And as far as the code is concerned, our language preferences are no more of a barrier to you and me writing code and working together than our indentation preferences are. And that's the way it should be. So we've translated the keywords, but you'll notice that we left the, uh, we didn't touch everything. So like the package names and the identifiers, those, those we kept in English. Let's see, is there a way that we can translate those as well? And people, there are a lot of debates on the right ways to choose variable names, but one thing that pretty much everyone agrees on is that they should be simple and concise. And, oh, sorry, descriptive and concise. And if you don't speak English, then it's not very descriptive to have English, uh, English code names. But in reality, many variable and function names are already actually highly structured. So we don't need to, you know, as, as Hopper mentioned, we already have the verbs that we use when we're talking about our programs. There's the common vocabulary. So we can take advantage of that in the translation step as well and translate these. In, 
oops, why did this not, uh, there we go. So yeah, so we have, you know, read foo, write foo, then, et cetera. These are common verbs that we'll already use when we write our JavaScript, uh, when we write JavaScript programs. And even if we don't translate all of them, having that on the right is a whole lot better. It's a whole lot more descriptive and understandable than what's on the rest. You might not know what foo means. You might not even be able to, uh, you might not even be able to pronounce that, but you can still tell now that that means that you're going to be reading something. It's some sort of an accessor method. So by being just a little bit more conscious about these conventions that we're already using, we can make our code that much more accessible to non-English speakers. We might not get all of these translations for free, but we can still get many of them, and that's a huge step forward. So now the million dollar question, could we do this with JavaScript? Well, there are a few reasons I chose Go for this example. In Go, the source code is required by the language spec to be in UTF-8. And that means that internally, strings and byte arrays are internally treated as UTF-8 as well, with an asterisk. But as far as we're concerned, it's true. JavaScript, though, is a little bit trickier, because source code in JavaScript, uh, it can kind of be whatever you want, whatever the interpreter happens to support. And as for the internal representation of strings, that's an even trickier question. If you talk to most people, they'll say it's UTF-16, um, AKA wide Unicode. Um, that's mostly true, except where it's not. Um, some people will also say that it's UCS-2. That's somewhat true, except where it's not. The reality is probably best described like this. JavaScript is some weird amalgamation of UTF-16 and UCS-2 internally. And um, it works. It's fine. You can deal with it. But it makes things a lot trickier when you're dealing with uh, non-ASCII, um, things outside the ASCII code points, especially when you're dealing with the actual, digging into the actual internals of the language implementation itself, because you can't, you can't rely on the source encoding, because it can be whatever the interpreter happens to support. And uh, yeah, you can't, rec you can't rely on that. And you're dealing with code points that are, that are far outside the ASCII code range, so you, can't, you need to be able to handle more than one byte at a time in your keywords. A lot of implementation particularly things that are implemented in C, they're going to struggle with that. So could we do this in JavaScript? I mean, honestly, I think so. I mean, it's definitely not as easy as, uh, as it is in Go. Like, I'd have outlined some of the challenges there, but it's definitely possible. That said, uh, one of my friends, who's a very diehard uh, JavaScript programmer, you may know them, uh, she told me that uh, the best way to get JavaScript developers to write something is to convince them that it can't be done in JavaScript. Her exact words are that if you tell them that they can't do this in JavaScript, then within an hour of your talk finishing, there'll be at least three packages on NPM which do that thing. So I'm going to go ahead and tell you that this cannot be done in JavaScript. And I'm going to bet that you all cannot prove me wrong. <laughs> so we've, now we've done all of the, uh, I would say, the source code itself. But there's more to programming and more to making programming accessible as well because you have to talk about the users. And the users include developers who are using developer tooling as well. Error messages are a big part of that. Node.js actually does a pretty good job with this by abstracting the way that messages are presented from the, uh, fr uh, from the internals of it. So JavaScript actually already does, I would say, well, some platforms of JavaScript does like maybe 70% of the work that you would need for this. Go is an approach to error handling that's different from most languages, but if you've actually written JavaScript, you're probably still familiar with it, because in JavaScript, you can't use accessors to, sorry, you can't use um, exception handling to, uh, for error handling within a callback because it's asynchronous code. Instead, you have to pass in error values and you have to operate on those values. Go actually just does the exact same thing, but it does it for all code, whether it's asynchronous or synchronous. And in Go, to use JavaScript terminology, basically the all errors are uh, an object that happens to have a dot error method on it. And that dot error method is guaranteed to return a string. That's the only thing that you're guaranteed to know about an error is that one specific method is present, and it will always return a string if it's, non, if it's uh, not null. And that applies to, that apply, that, that's a property that means it's very powerful, but it means that that message then needs to be accessible to people who don't speak English because, whoops, whoa, what happened here? Uh. 
Because as developers, we've all struggled with cryptic error messages. This first one's not from JavaScript. It's actually from Java, because, but it's my favorite because I've been using it so long as an example of a terrible error message that I've actually forgotten what it means. It is a real error message, but if you know what it means, tell me, because it's been years. I've forgotten. But JavaScript isn't immune either. The second one is from JavaScript. And if you write JavaScript a lot, you probably have an idea of what that means and what the error is. But if you've never written JavaScript, uh, you know, if this is your first time encountering that error, it's not really so clear what you need to do there to fix it. And certainly if you don't speak English, because the only thing that's worse than a cryptic error message is a cryptic error message in a language that you can't even understand. So translating error messages is a good starting point, because not only are they finite in number, but translating them will have a huge impact on the developers that you're interacting with. And they're the easiest to solve technically, because you can rely on existing localization strategies. And this is where I said that Node.js does a good job of making this abstraction available. We just don't, all, we just don't have that fully for all languages. We're not taking advantage of that, and we're certainly not taking advantage of it across the JavaScript ecosystem. But JavaScript already has lots of localization libraries that will provide variants of, of textual strings in a designated locale. They'll assist with things like pluralization and, and, and all that stuff. And all you need to do is just reference a lookup table. And that can be done by a computer, and you can present it to the user in, a, in, in the language that they're going to be able to understand. So we've talked, about a lot of, uh, we've talked about a lot of different things so far. And there are a lot of steps that we can take to including non-English speakers more in uh, JavaScript development. Making tool chains for translating code to other languages, like what we saw here with Goro, that's just one of them. And there's more as well. Like, I don't have time today to talk about the, some of the more community aspects, like documentation. How do you translate documentation? And more importantly, how do you make sure that that documentation stays in sync between across languages? How do you make things like mailing lists or even meetups and conferences like this? How do you make those accessible to people of all, who speak any language, not just people who happen to speak English? I don't have time to go into all those details today, but I've spoken about some of these challenges at, uh, in the past, so if you're interested, you can check that out or you know, come find me afterwards. But of course, that means that not, ever, not all this stuff is technical, but if you, or not all this stuff requires rolling up your sleeves and writing code, but some of it does, and if anyone's interested in going home and doing this with JavaScript and with another language, like what Coro does for, for Go, please, you know, by all means, go ahead and prove me wrong. Prove me that uh, wrong when I say that it can't be done in JavaScript. But others are straightforward and, and more low-tech. They involve the ways that we operate as a community. We're really just scratching the surface here. But for any of this stuff to happen, for any of this to be possible, we need to commit ourselves to doing it. We need to remember that 95% of the world doesn't speak English as their first language, and 89% of the world doesn't speak English fluently at all. Thanks to JavaScript's dominance over the web over the years, that means that you know, if there is a language that has been spoken and is being written today by, uh, uh, by active users, and it's there's, it's basically a certainty that at some point that language is being used alongside JavaScript, that JavaScript is handling that language in some capacity. That's, that's a virtual certainty just because of how widely used JavaScript is across the web and how powerful the web has been in transforming people's lives, not just in English-speaking countries, or, uh, but really all around the world. So it means that there's really no language that's as well suited as JavaScript is to being used by the entire world, not just by people who speak English. And we have an opportunity to bridge this language divide, to make Hopper's vision a reality in a way that no other programming language has ever been able to do before. So let's do that. Let's make JavaScript a programming language that's truly accessible to everyone, no matter what language you happen to speak. Thank you.